Hello, this is a Lord of the Rings The Living Card Game. Look at the first expansion pack in the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle, The Hunt for Gollum. The first card we're going to have a look at is the hero that comes in this box, the much talked about Bilbo Baggins. A lot of people were disappointed with the first hero that came in the expansion, and it's understandable. Bilbo has a fantastic ability on the bottom of this card, which reads, The first player draws one additional card in the resource phase. I know a lot of people play this game solo, and so the first player is always them, which means that you're always drawing two cards. This doubles your card draw, which completely changes the way that you play the game. I can't count how many times I've had too many resources, too few cards. This continues the theme of the lore deck with being a card drawing deck, and rather than Berylvor, who you had in the core set, who would have to exhaust to draw you two cards, which is better than Bilbo, you know, more cards than Bilbo's, but by exhausting her, you're losing her amazing 2 2 2 stat line. Uh, Bilbo just does this by being here. I mean, even in a two player game, he's going to be really increasing your card draw, which widens your options, particularly if you're using somebody like Eowyn, who needs card draw to use her own ability to its maximum potential. Having said all this, he has painful stats, probably the worst stats in the game of any hero with only one willpower, one attack, two defense. That's fine so far. We've seen heroes like this, like Eleanor in the spirit deck, two hit points. That makes a world of difference. He is the most fragile character from a hit point point of view in the game. His only real strength, stat-wise, is his defense of two, which is respectable. But with two hit points, you've got no leeway with the damage he can take. Uh, you get hit by a, a three attack, he's half dead. You get hit by a four attack, and he's out of the game. And that then relates to one of the biggest points of contention, which is his starting threat level, which is nine, which is as high as Legolas. Now, normally, the formula that the Lord of the Rings card game follows is that you add up the total of the willpower, attack, defense, and hit points, and that gives you the starting threat. Bilbo's starting threat by that formula should be six. This means that when you lose this two hit point character, that's a nine threat increase. With only two hit points, even using him one, even ignoring his use of the defense and obviously attack with only one attack, if you send him questing, a lot of quests have the gaze of the necromancer. So that's that's three times he could be taking a hit points damage. We don't see a lot of use of him unless we're playing three player games, really large player games where you can afford to have particularly fragile characters. In a one player game, I you'd have to have two exceptionally powerful heroes with him to compensate for his lack of ability. And then with two exceptionally powerful heroes like an Aragorn and a Glorfindel, you're looking at a starting threat of thirty four. I I don't really see Bilbo as too viable an option. I when whenever we use the law deck He's always the one that's left out. The first um, player deck expansion card is the Dunedain Mark, which is a one-cost attachment for the leadership deck. And the, the text reads, attached to a hero, attached hero gains plus one attack. And you can also, as an action, pay one resource from the attached hero's pool to attach Dunedain Mark to another hero. Personally, I'm a really big fan of this card because it turns your heavy hitters, such as your Legolas's, your Aragorn's, your Glorfindel's, into even bigger hitters. And particularly with someone like Legolas, whose ability isn't just about doing damage, it's about getting that kill. This increases his chances of doing that, because a lot of it, there are quite a few enemies with one defense, three hit points. With this mark put on him, he can take care of one of those by himself. And in a two-player game, you can one player can focus on you can give marks to the other player so you can give that character that hero the mark and also Legolas can be shooting the target against you I like this the turning dangerous heroes into even more dangerous ones the transferable aspect is is a plus but it's not something we've ever really used the second new card in the leadership deck is Campfire Tales which is a one cost event for the leadership deck and it, the action reads each player draws one card now I know there's a this card has not received a lot of love among solo players and understandably so you're paying one resource you draw one card in a two-player game it gets you know you get a lot more mileage one resource each player draws a card that's two cards 
Oh, the important thing I see about this card is that it's a non law deck card that lets you draw cards. Other decks really struggle with drawing cards, and sometimes, admittedly, playing one resource to one card isn't great, but I have had times where I'm playing where, God, I just think if I could just draw one more card, and I've got tons of resources, particularly with the leadership deck with things like Steward of Gondor and Gloin, where you're generating so many resources, I see this card as you know, a possible option in a sticky situation and far more viable in a two player game which is personally how I tend to play more. The new card, first new card to the tactics deck is the Winged Guardian which always turns into Winged Guardian Leviosa when we play from Harry Potter but it's a cheap ally initially uh, for absolutely amazing defense. It's two cost, it's got zero willpower, zero attack but four defense and one hit point. Uh, however, the downside to this card is that you are forced, after an attack in which the Winged Guardian defends, resolves, pay one tactics resource or discard the Winged Guardian from play. So he can be, unless you're willing to keep paying for him, a one-shot defender. Now, personally, I know a lot of allies that I tend to just throw on the bonfire anyway and don't expect them to survive another time. Two cost is a, a bit expensive to be doing that, but... The other important part of this card is that he's a sentinel. And this means, of course, again, sorry solo players, you're not getting anything for the sentinel. But in two player games, sentinels are huge. Suddenly, this one ally counts to both players in terms of defense because he can zip over. Um, I've also found it to be quite useful in a two of one deck hero and one tactics hero uh, where there are fewer tactics cards in the deck. So you might not be seeing them as much and you building up these resources on your tactics hero with nothing to spend them on, suddenly this guy gives you a use, and this four-cost defender, there's not a lot apart from your really big hitters out there that are actually going to kill him. Most of the time he'll only be leaving because you can't pay the cost. Um, but if you're willing to keep paying it, you've got an ally for as long as you'll keep paying because that's going to require five attack to kill this guy. So I'm quite a big fan particularly later in the cycle when there are cards that will key off Eagles discarding, so even if you don't pay for him, you're still getting something. The second card in the Tactics deck is the event The Eagles Are Coming, which is a zero-cost event and has the action, search the top five cards of your deck for any number of Eagle cards and add them to your hand. Shuffle the other cards back into your deck. At the moment, with just the Hunt the Golem, there are two Eagle cards. The Winged Guardian, and the Eagles are coming. So at this point, it's not very impressive. This is a card. The Eagles are coming is built for later in the cycle when you've got about eight Eagle Guardians, several Eagle allies, several um, eight Eagle allies, several Eagle events, things along those nature. Then the Eagles are coming can be a really handy card if you know the one card you draw this turn is the Eagles are coming. Well, you've got that chance to, for no cost to search through and find not only an eagle card, but perhaps the one you want. Because later in the game, there are lots of eagles for specific situations. As it stands at this point in the cycle, this card is hideously disappointing. But it is one that will grow into itself as the um, cycle continues. The new spirit card is the Westfold Horsebreaker. A two cost ally with one willpower, zero attack, and one defense with one hit point. He's a cheap ally, uh, he's got minor willpower, minimal defense. His action is really what he's designed for, which is discard the Westfold Horsebreaker to choose and ready a hero. Now, this can be extremely effective if you've got those big heroes in your deck your Aragorns, your Glorfindels, you're really wounded, therefore, really powerful, Gimli's. This is it's important that he doesn't need to exhaust and discard. You can send him on a well, you don't even, you know anything you're really gonna do is send him on a quest. You can send him on a quest for his one willpower, and then if sticky situation comes up, lots of enemies come out, and you really need defenders, discard this guy, and you've got one of your heroes standing back up, which can make the difference between an undefended attack and a defended attack. Um I do view him a little bit as a luxury ally, sort of like Gleowine in the lore deck, he's great to have when things are all clicking together as that safety net. But the discarding means that you're losing an ally, and I find you know, having allies in your tableau essential. 
for not putting those hits on your heroes, particularly if you don't have the lore deck and so the healing that will allow your heroes to keep going. Not a bad card, and you know, a pretty cheap addition to the uh, quite expensive allies that the Spirit deck with the Northern Tracker and the Lorien Guide, the Spirit deck uh, seems to enjoy. The other new card for the Spirit deck is the Mustering the Rohirrim, which you can see there's a lot of text. It's a one cost, basically it's very similar to the Eagles are coming in the Tactics deck. You search the top 10 cards of your deck for one Rohan ally and add it to your hand, then shuffle the cards back into your deck. It is very, very similar to the Eagles are coming. Instead of 5 cards with the Eagles are coming, you're getting 10 cards with this card. Instead of 0 cost, the Eagles are coming, it's 1 cost, this card. And just like the Eagles are coming, which gets better and better and better and better as the cycle goes along and you get more and more and more and more Eagle cards, this becomes better and better and better and better as the Rohan allies build up. The Spirit deck really struggles the card draw um, and really needs its big allies um, to be super effective. Um, and at the moment, those big allies, the Northern Tracker, he's not Rohirrim. Uh, as the deck goes along, you get some quite meaty uh, Rohan allies. So this card does have a use. One cost is a bit painful, but sometimes you need that ally if you're going to keep playing. The next card is the Law Deck. It is the Rivendale Minstrel. You can see she's three cost, she's two willpower, one, zero attack, and zero defense, with a mighty one hit point. However, it's her text, which I'll really get into later because it keys off a further card in this deck, is... Response. After you play the Rivendell Minstrel from your hand, search your deck for one song card and add it to your hand. Shuffle your deck. The song cards, if this is the first time you've looked at the expansion packs, won't really mean anything yet, so when we get onto that card I'll explain it. But as the card stands, three cost, that is expensive, but two willpower. I'm a big fan of two willpower allies, and the fact that she has no attack or no defense doesn't really bother me. I actually prefer allies who are good at one thing. She is hideously fragile. If the guys of the Necromancer comes out, she's dead. But two willpower, that's a really good addition to the lore deck, which struggles sometimes with willpower. And the other card for the lore deck is the one cost event, Strider's Paths. This event has the text, which I'll explain because it, it does need a bit of explanation. Response. After a, law, a location is revealed from the encounter deck, immediately travel to that location without resolving the travel effect. If another location is currently active, return it to the staging area. This card can be huge. It really gives the law deck some spirit trick, some spirit deck tricks. If you're on the, um, if you're committed to the quest and you're revealing the encounter deck cards and those really nasty travel locations come up, such as the Necromancer's Pass, when you travel there first player discards two cards at random it can be very punishing for its three threat um, addition to the staging area with this card for one cost you get to go there taking it out of the area getting rid of that three threat and you don't need to discard the cards which only means you've got to do that two, two uh, progress tokens on it to get rid of it there are other cards like the great forest web things like that that you're really going to want to avoid it's quite cheap as well it is situational, um, but it can make a world of difference. I mean, we have seen this get us out of very sticky situations. I'm quite a fan of the card, especially since um, the, the Lord Deck has a couple of ways to negate um, threat to return with secret paths, Radagast's cunning, things like that. But this really lets you get around that, those hideous travel effects, which until now, the only ways to do it has been through repeated Snowborn Scouts in the leadership deck or um, things like the Northern Tracker in the uh, Spirit deck. So for the Lore deck to have a trick like that <coughs> is particularly effective. And the final card is the Neutral card. This card is the Song of Kings. It costs one resource to pay. Text attached to a hero. Attached hero gains the Leadership Resource icon. Songs for me have changed the game, how you play the game completely. A multi-sphere deck until now, I only really felt comfortable when I would do it with Aragorn and um, to Aragorn, Theodrid and Eowyn because you could have the chance of drawing a Celebrin stone um, with Aragorn which would give him the spirit resource icon which would give you two leadership of two 
spirit resource icons and balance out the problem with the resource management. Now, the Song of Kings and the latest songs in the expansion packs allow you to turn any hero into two spheres. So, you know, you have Aragorn, Legolas, and Farlin in a party. You put the Song of Kings on Farlin, and now you've got Aragorn with leadership, Legolas with tactics, and Farlin with leadership and tactics for the purposes of spending. I changed the game utterly, and now you see why the Rivendell Minstrel is so important with her ability to just look through the deck for that song, pull it out, you've got it in your hand. For me, this, this the songs really do change the game, and as the cycle continues, there is a song for every faction, uh, for every sphere, sorry. Uh, I, I, I really do feel that they've broadened the game a great deal, and they do make even three sphere decks possible. Uh, you've still got to draw these songs or draw the Rivendell Minstrel to give you the song. Um, but I, I mean, I'm a huge, huge fan, especially since they're neutral. So anyone can pay for them to get them onto the table. It's not like you have to have a leadership hero to even play the Song of Kings. It's even possible, if you're feeling particularly gutsy, to have the Song of Kings in your deck with some very cheap leadership cards, your Snowborn Scouts, possibly even Steward of Gondor, um, get the Song of Kings, put it on a hero, and suddenly you've got a leadership resource icon hero. means you can play cards like Steward of Gondor, Snowborn Scout, um, Sneak Attack, those sorts of cards. It's risky, and it's not something that we've ever really tried, but I think with the Rivendell Minstrels, you could probably give it a decent go, especially if, if you're using the Rivendell Minstrels, presumably you've got lore cards, so you could have um, quite a lot of card draw to guarantee seeing these cards and to compensate if you get a handful of leadership cards when you haven't got the song yet so you can't really spend them. Um, all in all, the Hunt for Gollum is the first step in a cycle. Uh, I could imagine if this cycle was just the one thing that, if this expansion was just the one thing that had come out, I could be slightly disappointed. I have waited till the cycle is completed and I have bought the packs quickly, one after another. Um, so even the initial disappointment of, oh, the eagles are coming, it's useless. Get the second pack. Oh, a few more eagles. Third pack. Oh, more eagles. More. So on and so forth. Um, it really needs to be seen as a whole, rather than as in two card stages. But, so I would really recommend. I'm going to be doing more videos on the uh, rest of the cycle. So if you want to see how it all starts to mount up, I'm going to be trying to refer back to cards we've seen in this expansion, and so on and so forth as we go along. So you can sort of see how it escalates. Hope you've enjoyed this video, and see you for the second expansion pack, Conflict at the Carrack.